Can everybody hear me? I, I, I think I can hear myself. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this session on uh, Azerbaijan sport washing or nation building. Uh, my name is James Dorsey and I'm going to be the, your traffic cop for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, one remark that I want to uh, make in advance of this is that obviously the experience of Azerbaijan is a very important experience and has its own characteristics but it, think, it strikes me that it's worthwhile keeping in mind in looking at, at Azerbaijan in and of itself first of all but also in terms of although the comparison is only partial also in terms of looking forward what some of these issues mean for Qatar as we move forward over the next seven years. We've got four speakers, three presentations, and um, for the sake of time, I would suggest that we kick off immediately with uh, Gulnara Khundova and Rebecca Vincent of the International Media, uh, Media Support and Sport and for Rights Campaign. I don't know which of the two of you is starting. <laughs> in connection um, with a previous campaign, Art for Democracy. Uh, Gulnara um, had to leave Azerbaijan herself after the arrests of several of our close colleagues. Um, we want to start, I should know actually, seeing as how we do have people from the Azerbaijani government present um, who might speak in the discussion portion and who will be presenting in the plenary session tomorrow. Um, you'll, you'll hear a, a few things about us. Um, probably that we're part of some big international anti-Azerbaijani plot. This is untrue. Um, the Azerbaijani colleagues that we work with are among the most patriotic people I have ever met. They have all gone through serious um, personal sacrifices to try to improve the situation in their country. I don't see how that can be considered anti-Azerbaijani. Um, also, you, you might hear things like there are no political prisoners in Azerbaijan, which is resolutely untrue. Um, it's not just us saying this, it's well documented um, by credible international organizations, um, including the European Parliament, who recently issued a resolution calling for the release of, of specifically named political prisoners. Okay, um, I, we thought we'd start with a short video clip from Christiane Amanpour's um, CNN program, um, just a one minute clip um, that was broadcast during the European Games. of sports has been bedazzled by the first ever European Games, its spectacular new stadiums and opening extravaganza. But imagine a world behind the glitz where instead of using the European Games to promote respect for European values, the host Azerbaijan is doing the opposite. At these games, human rights and free speech are finishing last. Notorious for its censorship, Azerbaijan is barring many foreign correspondents and locking up many of their own journalists. Recently, from her prison cell, the award-winning reporter Khadija Ismailova wrote, 
The truth is that Azerbaijan is in the midst of a human rights crisis. Things have never been worse. As those at the top continue to profit from corruption, ordinary people are struggling to work, struggling to live, struggling for freedom. And we must struggle with them for them. And that is what we here will continue to do as well. Um, hello, everyone. I am Gulnara Hundova with International Media Support. And it's a bit hard to speak after this introduction because I just saw my colleague uh, on this video who was uh, brutally beaten to death in uh, August this year. And he died in a hospital uh, because doctors failed to provide him with medical care. And that happened in Azerbaijan, the country which proudly hosted European Games and which has ambition to host uh, Formula One Grand Prix next year and many other large sporting events such as, for example, World Cup. Uh, for Azerbaijani regime, it is very, very important to uh, promote themselves uh, by hosting large international sporting events. That's why for us human rights defenders it is very important to be at events like here, like this event, to blame and shame government for outrageous human rights abuses, murders of journalists, arrest of human rights defenders, journalists, bloggers and free speech activists, Draconian legislation impeding work of human rights organizations, NGOs, and journalists. It is indeed very important to talk about that. Unfortunately, these days our colleagues cannot join us to speak up, and it's only me and Rebecca who can make it for the event because others either in prisons or they are in political exile and they cannot travel. Some of my colleagues are under illegal travel ban in Azerbaijan. They really wanted to come here to speak, but that was not possible because the government imposed an illegal travel ban on them. They are locked up in the country. I just wanted to uh, briefly talk about the case of Rasul Jafarov, whom uh, Rebecca mentioned. Rasul Jafarov was a founder of Sport for Rights campaign which had a legitimate aim to raise awareness on human rights situation in Azerbaijan ahead of European Games. But of course the government of Azerbaijan could not tolerate that. That's why they put bogus charges against Rasul, such as illegal business and tax evasion, which were completely bogus. So they put him in jail. And Rasul, who is only 30 years old and who is quite well known internationally for his commitment to human rights, is now languishing in Azerbaijani prison. He is not alone there. There are up to 100 political prisoners in Azerbaijan, including award-winning investigative journalism, Had journalist Hadija Ismailova, and you saw her uh, image uh, on the video. And, um, so that's uh, basically key point, and then maybe you can join me, and then I'll jump in if needed. Um, so basically, in preparing for the European Games, the authorities started um, carrying out this unprecedented human rights crackdown. Our colleagues, who Gulnara mentioned, we would consider prisoners of the Games um, because we do believe that they were arrested um, in effect to try to silence them before the world's attention was on the country. During the games itself, um, violations continued. Um, you, you may be aware of reports of prominent international journalists being barred access to the country, uh, for example, from The Guardian. Um, international human rights defenders were also prevented from coming to Azerbaijan, including Amnesty International um, and Platform, uh, an organization based in London that's affiliated with our campaign. Um, during the games, as they were still ongoing before the, the closing ceremony, there was a high-level threat made against our colleague Amin Mili. He's the director of Maidan TV, which is an independent online television station. Um, he reported uh, receiving an indirect threat from the Minister of Youth and Sport um, in connection with Maidan TV's critical coverage of the games. You may remember stories um, such as um, the tragic crash of a, a bus driver into three Austrian swimmers. 
um, and exposure of uh, local television stations um, running interviews with fake tourists. Um, those were originally covered by Maidan TV and the international media largely picked up on this. We believe that is um, a key reason that um, Amin has faced threats. And I just wanted to mention another example of uh, how government of Azerbaijan punish critics. Uh, there is a <coughs> prominent free expression advocate in Azerbaijan, Elin Husseinov, and he was the leader of uh, country's leading NGO Institute for Reporters Freedom and Safety. So first the government closed down the office of Institute for Reporters Freedom <coughs> and Safety, then they closed down Objective TV, which was outlet managed by uh, Institute for Reporters Freedom and Safety. Uh, they imposed travel ban on all the staff of that organization and they brought um, criminal charges against Emin Hussein of the leader. Uh, free expression advocate and he was forced into hiding first and then Swiss embassy in Baku provided him with a temporary shelter. So the guy spent 10 months at the embassy of Switzerland in Baku and he was only given safe passage from Azerbaijan on the very day of the opening of the European Games. He left Azerbaijan but then his story didn't finish. President Aliyev decided to renounce his nationality and Emin is now stateless in Switzerland. This happened before in the countries like Egypt where there was unprecedented human rights crackdown and it is happening now in the countries like, I I it is happening now in Azerbaijan. Uh, but still Azerbaijan proudly hosted European Games and then Azerbaijan is preparing for Formula One. And we believe that, we as we human rights defenders, we believe that it is uh, our role, uh, role of uh, all those uh, uh, sporting organizations, sporting uh, associations, NGOs, to demand uh, human rights improvements in a countries like Azerbaijan before allowing them to host events such as Euro Games or Formula One. Um, in the aftermath of the games, the repression continues. Um, I mentioned Maidan TV. Um, after that threat made against its director, um, the authorities have gone to great lengths to target all of Maidan TV staff and their families. Um, one of Maidan TV's editors, Gunal Muvlud, her two brothers um, were arrested just last week on, uh, separately on um, spurious drugs-related charges and remain in prison. A number of Maidan TV staff are facing travel bans, um, so they can't leave the country. Um, a number have been called in for questioning by the prosecutor's office um, in connection with Maidan TV's activities. Um, and one young reporter, a 19-year-old um, freelance correspondent for Maidan TV, um, was recently detained for 30 days um, after being held incommunicado um, for about a day and a half, was eventually charged with allegedly resisting police, um, and then remained in detention for a month. The pressure continues. Um, Gunara mentioned the murder of our colleague Rasi Maliev, um, who was brutally beaten one year to the date that the organization he, he worked for, the Institute for Reporters Freedom and Safety, one year from the time that the authorities um, raided and closed their office. He died the next day in hospital. Rasim is um, just the latest in a series of hundreds of violent attacks against journalists um, over the past several years in the country. Um, and there have been virtually no independent investigations um, into any of these attacks. Nobody has been brought to justice. Sorry. Um, I, I want to, to touch upon really the involvement of the sporting world in this. Um, this was an opportunity for the country. Um, many good things could have happened. Um, however, the Azerbaijani government's resistance, the sort of attempt to um, sort of cleanse the, the image of the country, as would be obvious to the international community during the games, um, backfired. Uh, in barring international journalists' access to the country, in you know unleashing unprecedented repression, they showed a, the sinister side of Azerbaijan to the world. Um, it, this wasn't the doing of campaigns with ours, the actions spoke for themselves. Um, but still, the European Olympic committees and other sporting officials um, tried to stay out of it. You often hear this um, 
with things like this that it's not our role um, to, to get involved um, in the internal affairs of countries. Um, but we believe that the sporting world does very much have responsibility um, when it chooses to go to places like Azerbaijan um, for the impact in the country and um, the, the people afterwards who are all these months later still paying the price. Failing to do the right thing and take a stand is essentially helping regimes like the Azerbaijani authorities um, to sports wash their images. Um, with regard to Baku 2015, the European Olympic Committees uh, did stick very much to this so-called policy of non-intervention. Um, EOC President Patrick Hickey has made statements such as, we are very sympathetic to all these human rights situations, but we don't have the right to tell a sovereign government what to do or how to behave. Um, he did have to acknowledge uh, when The Guardian was banned from the country that such actions were completely against the spirit of sport, adding, we have been working away behind the scenes to solve these problems. So this is something that we would call on bodies like the EOC to do in the future, is not just to leave those discussions for behind closed doors, to take a public stance, um, really, um, in accordance with the Olympic Charter's um, provisions for press freedom and human dignity. Um, our campaign reached out to national Olympic committees across Europe, um, asking them also to speak out. Something you might hear from the authorities is that we called for a boycott of the Games, which we did not. Um, we didn't call on athletes not to participate. We did not call on the public not to attend. Uh, we called on national Olympic committees to use the opportunity to take a stand. And we called on European leaders um, not to attend the opening ceremony unless political prisoners were released. Political prisoners were not released and most European leaders chose not to go. From the national Olympic committees we got mixed responses. Um, some stuck to the EOC's policy of sort of non-intervention. The British Olympic Association um, chief executive stated, we always have a consistent policy. We are here purely for sports reasons and not political reasons. Although they did also later have to express disappointment when The Guardian was banned, um, when they came under some pressure within the UK. However, other Olympic committees were very strong. Um, the German DOSB was consistently um, outspoken on these issues for months leading up to the Games. Um, the German DOSB chair, Michael Vesper, said, among other things, of course, we are in solidarity with the people who are working in Azerbaijan for human rights. The DOSB stands for human rights and freedom of the press. We will address both issues in Baku. Other Olympic committees followed that line as well, so really a mixed result. Now, um, as the authorities begin to prepare for Formula One next year, the, the European Grand Prix will take place in July in Baku. Um, we seem to have an even more problematic response from, from the Formula One organizers. F1 chief Bernie Eccleston has already stated, when asked on human rights in Azerbaijan, I think everybody seems to be happy. There doesn't seem to be any big problem there. Statements like that are not just removing themselves from commenting on it, but actively helping the regime to whitewash its, whitewash its image. So once again, as I said, that we are here just to blame and shame and to encourage you to demand action and concrete improvements from the governments like Azerbaijani government and do not allow sporting events to help uh, the government repressive regimes whitewash their images. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is... <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rasima Diallo, who is CEO and founder of the Young Business Factory. Rasim. So, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, it is easy uh, to talk about problem. Uh, to judge actually organization or some people actually and I always said that it is very hard to solve problem how to uh, make offers uh, to solve this problem actually and today we will talk about the impact of the European Games on Azerbaijan uh, I will give you some facts about that and uh, my name is Rasim Ajalov I am young business consultant in Azerbaijan actually some statistics about me, I, I consult actually more than uh, 63 uh, companies, private companies in Azerbaijan. 
I gave some uh, rules, actually, regulations to uh, Economic and Development Minister of Azerbaijan about taxes uh, last year. And I have also students from uh, private companies and universities, actually. And this is some statistics about Azerbaijan, as you see. Right? Yeah, this one. Uh, you know, the hi you can highlight actually uh, Azerbaijan is the first democratic republic uh, in the Islamic world, and women voting right actually 19 uh, at nine, uh, 80, 18 years old. And uh, I want to say that sport is a wonderful ability to gather people together and peace uh, and promote peace actually. And uh, I want to also mention that when we need it, if we, we need actually sport games, we can do, but when we don't need, I, I think that we can, uh, we don't must actually organize for these events. And main part is uh, Baku European Games. We started June uh, 12 actually. More than uh, 6,000 athletes in 30 sports. Some facts actually you can highlight. Uh, you will see, uh, we will invite actually Lady Gaga performance, imagine. I don't know how much uh, money we spend for that. And uh, the tickets actually is cheap, it's low uh, for tourists, uh, that's good. And the most uh, main point is that Azerbaijani paying the cost uh, all of the athletes who is coming for Olympic Games actually. And this is uh, near the one billion, uh, Minister of Sports said that. Another fact is that uh, we also have disadvantages and uh, advantages f uh, for actually European Games. You will see we will increase our infra in infrastructure actually to speed up projects. We have planning for a long time. This is a, a very good actually project for Azerbaijan and we will involve more than 1,000 actually volunteers uh, who is the actual paid job and I am also part of it actually for first time but I will cancel, I will talk about it. Uh, some statistics, wait, oh, I am sorry. And this is the first uh, actual I said. Mm. <laughs> we will actually bought uh, more than uh, 300 new buses. Uh, before the European Games, uh, we have no actually very crowded buses, uh, I want to say that. And after that, uh, this uh, buses using in transport, that's very good for us. And uh, we opened actually railway station, uh, speed up actually railway station to the Sumgait with, uh, between Baku. And I want to say, mention one thing, uh, please uh, remind that our uh, actually average of the salary is uh, 180 per month for teachers and also you can add doctors and this is the main fact and Baku actually will likely to bid for another Olympic Games uh, as it gets ready to host Formula Grand Prix yeah. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk about economic growth and economic development in Azerbaijan Actually, you know, economic growth actually is very high for Azerbaijan. It means that the number of the actually GDP. But uh, the government actually, I think that uh, disadvantage is that they don't think about economic development. Uh, actually, economic growth, uh, which is uh, related with quality and quantitative actually resources. We will increase our resources. We will, for example, build up any buildings we organize any sports by spending more money. Actually, this is uh, improve our economic growth. But uh, I think that uh, the government must think about economic development, which is the life quality, which is the improve our quality, actually community quality and quantity actually of the economy. For example, we have uh, problems in Azerbaijan in free economic and free market. It is very hard to open businesses in Azerbaijan, I think that, uh, because we have more monopolists. Also, Mr. Uh, our president actually said that. Uh, he understand that uh, the very, we have very problem actually for this year about the value of the money. Uh, Manat, Azerbaijani Manat is uh, down actually and dollar is rising. This is very created big problem for entrepreneurs. 
uh, and he, he said that uh, we must stop checkup of uh, entrepreneurs actually. Uh, this is example is that, uh, for example, government, uh, minister of the economy actually, minister of the taxes, all of, uh, for example, once a week, once a month, to go to the checkup with entrepreneurs, and they will have uh, more actually punishment for that, more than uh, 2,000, for example, manat. And uh, Mr. President actually understand that this is great, very big problem, and he stop it. And uh, the main point actually, uh, I think that, uh, how to say, advantage of the government, government, Uh, government open to qu uh, offers actually. They understand that uh, it is very e uh, not easy to manage actually this government because Azerbaijan's GDP is growing. We have uh, more resources actually and it is very hard. And after that uh, it is very actually best part is that government open for offers. Uh, we prepare some offers for government actually. This is us promo, one of foundation. I think that uh, we will spend uh, actually more money for uh, which is the not working actual not working efficiently sport games, and this is very created big problem for actually our community. Imagine that uh, this is a one circle, this is a second circle, and we have third circle. In third circle is government. In the middle, second circle is our community, and the uh, first circle is that actually aims, I mean that. Uh, the main problem is that government don't think about economic development, life quality of the community is the main part. I think that we must, uh, we must think about actually the for community. And they don't think about community actually. We can spend actually this money for the actually to improve our quality in community. For example, uh, to increase to open actually more arena, sport arena for free. Yeah, that is the main part. I think that I am a, a footballer, motivated footballer. I can't find any actually uh, stadium in Azerbaijan for free. And uh, they all of uh, stadiums, uh, for example, uh, 50 manat, uh, it means that uh, approximately 53 dollars per hour. And this is paid. Very small, actually, very uh, uh, s a little bit size of the actually small number in stadiums free in Azerbaijan. And this is actually don't motivate who is want to uh, organize sport games, who is mot motivated for sports, actually. If we will want to increase our tourism, we must invest, actually, you will see, in the tourism part to open actually more hotels, to decrease our prices in hotels. Uh, to open actually very tu uh, tourism objects in Azerbaijan. And uh, we don't do that, but government think about it. Uh, I am very glad to, uh, to hear about actually uh, Minister of the Tourism. Uh, they start to actually, uh, how to say, simplify uh, with a procedure for Azerbaijan. Another thing that I want to mention, our oil and gas is decreases year by year. And the main, actually, uh, I want to highlight government, uh, think about it, actually, invest in tourism, invest in, you see, actually, wait, uh, alternative energy and construction. We really need that, because if we don't invest our money efficiently, we will lose it. We will lose our community, we will lose our country. If we will lose our country, it will be as like Sa Syria, as like Palestine, actually, uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, actually lifetime is stabilized, but we were hard, not as like I think that uh, Denmark, because Denmark I see that everything is going systemized, but our system is as like this. We don't have stable system in government regulation, we must stabilize it, we must work efficiently actually. My offer is that in here, uh, don't spend more money, actually, I think that, uh, to my opinion, don't spend more money for sport games, actually. Yes, we must do. We must do, actually, spend more money, but when we need it. Uh, in last speech, I want to say that uh, everything is normal in Azerbaijan, but it can be better. It 
can be better than uh, another actual years. I think that we have resources, we have everything, we have ability, uh, we have actually offers for the government. Uh, when I will came back, actually come back, actually to Azerbaijan, uh, I I have some uh, how to say rules, regulations, offers for uh, actually uh, to our government. I think that they will accept it. And uh, most of questions actually asked me about uh, journalists about European games. I didn't apply for European games. Uh, some of HR, uh, human resource manager from the Hilton Baku, uh, gave me reference to the European games. And after that, I get a calling, uh, f calling was calling a uh, phone call actually from the HR, uh, I think that's the name of Aitak Kim Hanum. Uh, from HR of the European Games, uh, Bekok. He invited me uh, to work as supervisor, uh, and they will give uh, gave me actually uh, 40 people to manage it, I mean team members. Uh, I have three positions actually, European Games. But uh, when I heard about uh, FIRED in Azerbaijan, which is the used very simple face of the building, fired and uh, more than uh, I think that 15 people is died in this situation. This is my people actually, I mean that uh, this is my community. This is touched my feelings actually. Uh, money can be earned. In that reason I said that uh, in the first day uh, of the my work, I cancel actually my position in Baku Begok. And I am sorry values is more important my switch salary. That is not one day we will also have family because is uh, this firing building actually uh, fired one girl uh, which is the years is four and this is very touched to my feelings. Uh, I always said that uh, it is easy to earn money, but it is not easy to earn about values actually. If we are here, uh, we are here for actually to get offers from the foreigners to benchmarking about experience and go to the back to Azerbaijan to using efficiently to our community and to our actually uh, government, I think that. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you. And then last but not least, uh, David Bloss of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And I'm asking the ruling family. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first off, I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad the Azeri delegation is here. Very glad. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about is um, not how, how we cover the family, but why we do it. Because um, we do get some criticism. Some of it might be legitimate that we're too focused on it organization started in Sarajevo. We work from Latvia to Azerbaijan. Uh, it's not a large organization, so we cover a lot of countries. Um, Azerbaijan's an important country to us, not just from a new standpoint. I live in Georgia, um, neighboring country. The biggest taxpayer in Georgia is Sokar, the state oil country of Azerbaijan. So economically, what happens in Azerbaijan has a huge effect in the Caucasus. Any of you paying attention to the gas and oil future of Europe knows that what's going on in Azerbaijan, pipeline through Georgia, through Turkey, this affects a lot of people in this room. So to, uh, to us, it's an, it's an important country, and it has been for a long time. I first came to the region in 2003. Um, I've been in, been in and out of it. Um, the why on the family is sort of based on the fact that they made a conscious decision um, to be involved in everything in the country. As mentioned in the earlier uh, session in the other room, um, they had the head of the uh, Olympic Commission. They're ahead of a lot of things. And this is their choice, you know, it's the society's choice. It's not for us to say we're journalists, but they are ahead of the cultural things. That his wife has many positions, daughters have many positions. Um, if you look at the state news coverage, which we do in a lot of countries as sort of an indicator you know, of how a society is organized, how a society looks at itself, how a government organizes itself. State news coverage is very much based on the activities of the family on any given day. Some of it's very newsworthy, some of it isn't. So our feeling is, you know, they, they have made themselves the news in the country. They've, they've made that choice. 
Um, and I'm always very leery when you're on the outside to, uh, you know, make rash statements. But he says you take very seriously. He lives there. There is, there is a news vacuum in the country in, to this respect. Um, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a very classic example. He has a little bit of it in his chart there. In February, I think it was, there was a 33% um, devaluation of the Minot against the dollar. So even in an oil country, that's pretty drastic. When that happened, it was like 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, very short statement, and we'll talk to you on Monday. And that was it. Like, bang. Um, when I first got to the region in 2003, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in media coverage in Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, the three countries of the Caucasus. But there's a fairly significant difference now. It's pretty tough for journalists outside the state journalism system to have access to officials, to have access to data routinely. There is no back and forth. And uh, these are post-Soviet countries. Believe me, Georgia's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But the normal give and take professional respect of government to media really doesn't exist there right now for a lot of people, okay? So that, that's the day-to-day -day work. I should mention that people Rebecca talked about, and uh, we know the same people. We are not advocates. We're, we are journalists. It's a journalism organization. So while we're talking about the same people, you know, I'll, I'll talk about them a little, a little bit differently, which is that the travel bans are serious. You know, they, they, they can't get in and out. Um, Maidan TV is an attempt, and to me, you know, we make judgments on who we think will do a neutral job, if not now, in the future. And we do work with them a little bit. We work with, it, work with individuals within that organization because we do know them as people, and we see them as people who can have open minds. They, you know, it's, it's, it's tough in this situation. I've, I've told people who've asked me about this that, with some exception, I, I don't see them as people being angry at the government, even though they have travel bans, they're having problems with their families. What they say is very true in a lot of cases. They, they, they seem more dumbfounded because the changes, again, as an outsider in the last year or two have been pretty drastic in the media. And th this is not just a media thing. And I urge you guys that care enough about, you know, take a little look at Google afterwards or read up on this a little bit. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting time there. I mean, human rights people have had trouble for a couple of years. Journalists have had right, trouble for a couple of years. There's been quite a few arrests inside the government in the last few weeks. There's been two or three instances in the embassies outside of people who've kind of made it clear they don't want to come home. You know, th this is not normal. This is not, you know, very sustainable. So we don't know what's going to happen there. It's a long way of saying it's an important country for us and that we feel the family's important. So we do concentrate on them. Um, there's a certain futility, I think, in any government in this day and age, anywhere in the world, think that you can, you know, shut down information. Ten or twelve years ago, it wasn't that hard to close a newspaper or to make the tax for printing on the printing house, you know, so exorbitant that a newspaper couldn't survive. Television stations are always going to be vulnerable, whether it's licensing, transmission. You know, you, you, you can close media outlets, and we see it all over the world. We see it in all our countries. You can close media outlets down, and 10 more websites will start tomorrow. You, can, you, can't, you, can't, you can't slam the door on the information. No, nobody's, nobody can. So, I, it, it, you know, it kind of breaks my heart in a way, not just because I do this for a living, but I see a lot of energy in governments. I see a lot of energy in the stuff he's talking about, you know, development, economic development, things like that. You know, where I see this futile attempt, you know, to st stop basic flow of information. Um, Azerbaijan's, you know, blessedly very plugged into the world economically. Sokar is a world-class oil company. Not just because there's a lot of oil on the ground, but in their operation. Very professional. What that means is that information, that data, is out in the world, too. You know, it's not a public company. It's not a public traded company. 
But any time they do anything significant in the world, there's somebody somewhere, if they borrow money anywhere in the world, which all companies have to do, you have to give information. And that's the kind of thing we're kind of systematically trying to work with journalists in our region to do. And, and that, that's sort of a subtle point there. We, we could write stories ourselves, perhaps. That's for our particular organization, that's really not our goal, is you know, we, we want to work with journalists in the area, show them what is available in terms of data, what you can do even in a situation where you don't have maybe good sources and good, you know, good back and forth relationships, and how you can make a story from that. Um, journalists in this room, this won't come any surprise to you, but probably as editors, we spend 90% of our time killing stories. And we think that's an important part of what we do too, because in countries like this, situations like this, in that region, a lot of rumors, a lot of, oh, they must own this, or you know, they own that, or everybody knows this, everybody knows that. A lot of which over the years used to be printed, used to be on TV, you know, like gospel. And we do our best to say, no, we're not printing that, we're not, you know, we're not making a video of that, we're not putting that online. Let's see what we can find out. If there's something there, we'll do a story, but we'll do a story only up to the point that you could prove it. I mean, Hadish is a dear friend, but we fought like, you know, we fought like weasels, you know, because we'd say, no, we need more. And it's the same with all of them. We'd say, no, this is what's available. This is what we can find out. This is what we can print. So, so what's available? Banking system. You know, this was, we've already done this story. Banks are, you know, are part of the world. So most banking information, including down to who are, who are the ultimate owners, that, that's pretty public information. They have a very public case now that you know, one of their bigger banks, and the national banks, $3 billion in debt. And there's had to be some adjustments. There's been adjustments of people. There's been adjustments in some bonds and some shifting some finances around to, you know, to get it out of debt. You know, it's, again, it's 2015. You can't do this over in a little corner someplace. If three billion dollars is moving around in any economy, there's a record of it. What's a little tougher for journalists there is at this point, um, and I'll put some blame on the journalists too. Believe me, you know this this system developed probably in the last 10 years. It was not a good system. People did not try hard enough, and, and honestly, in my respect, to to develop sources inside the government. You know, things went bad kind of quickly, still do, but you gotta try. And we do this, we talk about this in the other countries too. You can't, you can't just say the government, because there's no such thing in the world as the government anywhere. There's a person or a small group of people making this decision or has this paper on their desk or has this responsibility. And, and as journalists, you know, it's always our job even in difficult situations, try to find that person, try to talk to them. Is the answer no, 90% of the time? Yeah, and I'd say that in a lot of countries. You know, journalism is 90% no, 10% yes. 10% is a good day. But even without, you know, a story like the banking story, what's missing is probably not access to talk to the bankers, probably not access to talk to the ministry, unless you're inside the, you know, inside the state media system. So it's not perfect. There's a well-balanced story, has that explanation, has that other voice. You know, data is data, and we can write off the data. Sometimes there are reasons why things happen. And sometimes smart people know what those reasons are. And a good story, you know, a good media organization will do their best to get that voice also. But that's what's missing in this equation now. And you know, talking about hope for the future, I mostly work with you know people his age in all in all three countries. And you know, for us, it's playing a long game. Yeah, it gets frustrating day in and day out. Reporters get frustrated day in and day out. But you know, it, you're, you're trying to look at a longer picture. There's there's good people inside government, good people outside government. Smaller countries like this, you went to school together. There are relationships. There should be relationships. It's how, how do we build them? How do we build them as journalists? How do we build them with our work? 
um, whistleblowing. I'll just talk about it very quickly. Um, again, the journalists in the room probably know this, that um, offshore data becomes more available by the day. And in cases like the Aliyev family, a lot of other people, including in my country, believe me, um, offshore data is where the stories are. Nowhere in the world are people just taking their money, putting it in the bank transparently, taking it out, paying their 30% taxes. Nowhere is that happening. So again, when you say, you know, how, you know, how do we do the job of, uh, you know, looking at the family? Um, more of that data is available all the time. There are more whistleblowers all the time. I don't know any personally. I don't know their motives. I know that the material's out there, and it's out there for everybody. So again, our job is work with these young journalists and say, okay, this is available. This is data. You know, what does it mean? Does a family own this boat? Do they own this house? Is there a name of somebody who's involved in 50 things that maybe the family involved in? There's some kind of pattern here. It's slow work. And if you're you know, a young person, young journalist, you don't have the patience for this. And, um, but we have to. So for us, it's public documents, things like banks, the fact that, blessedly, it's you know, not a perfect economy, but a good one. So almost any significant country, company there has some kind of business outside. The minute you have business outside, you have reporting responsibilities. So you look for them, piece by piece, and the offshores. So with that, um, we have several people both inside the country and outside. We have other journalists. And we just sort of methodically, country by country, look for things. You know, just, 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 just the scut work of journalism. Put it together. We talk. Do we know this is true? We do try to get comment. We do try to get um, a second voice. We fail a lot at that. And that, that, that's a failing of ours. And, you know, we, we have to do better. We have to figure out a way to get, to get another voice into these stories. Um, I will go back to my last point. I'll close it up here, which is, as it stands now, we'll keep doing these stories. Um, I can't go back to the same point that it is futile to try to stop them, and that's not us being macho or anything like that. This is the truth anywhere in the world. You know, whatever you think the internet, you know, pro or con, the days of closing newspapers, closing TV stations, closing off information anywhere in the world, those days are over. So we have the information. Our job is to find it, use it responsibly, and somehow in these situations develop some relationships. You know, so it is a professional relationship between government, between industry, and between reporters. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, we've got about uh, 35 minutes for questions. Um, I think what we'll do is take them in batches of three. If you would identify yourself, uh, identify who your question is to, and keep questions or comments short. Who would like to take the floor? <laughs> Hello, I'm Andy Brown from the Sports Integrity Initiative. Um, I just wanted to ask basically all members of the panel, really, um, what good has hosting the, the um, Baku 2015 European Games actually done for the regime in power? Any other questions? Lady in the back. Uh, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, my name is Hanna Brevik. Um, uh, I'd like to know uh, about uh, um, the family's ambition for hosting uh, sports competitions. What, why, why are they doing it, obviously, but what are their ambitions 
what are their plans for the future? The next big competition is the Formula One, and then what? Um, if somebody could uh, give an answer to that, that would be great. Thanks. Anybody else? If I, if I can just, just add a third question then, which is, I'd be curious to know what the sort of thought process was or, or the evaluation was, which follows up a little bit on Andy Brown's question in terms of uh, first anticipating a uh, reputational risk with engaging on, on, a, on, a, on a mega sport event, and then looking back at it in retrospect, which in reputational terms was obviously not a success, and, what, you know, and how they deal with that and what lessons they, they draw from that. Thank you very much for very uh, interesting and relevant questions. So the regime was really hoping that by hosting the event, they will uh, promote themselves and they will, that uh, this event will help them to foster their image. And when I say the regime, it's basically the president and his family. Because uh, it was, uh, for many people, it was very, it sounded very ridiculous and funny when they saw that each member of Aliyev family was carrying out Olympic torch. And then it was filmed and shown everywhere in Azerbaijan as a great achievement because media is largely controlled by the state in Azerbaijan. And the message which went to Azerbaijani public was, look, we are hosting Olympic Games, real Olympic Games, and this is thanks to the president and his wife. So this is achievement of our country, and we should thank president and his wife for this achievement. So first of all, they wanted to boost their image at home, but also to promote their image internationally. That Azerbaijan is a very modern country, Baku is really a huge city, very vibrant, beautiful city, and look at uh, us, we host this event, and we are a regional leader. So that was hope, and that was anticipation. Luckily, that this hope didn't come true. This ambition uh, was not realized, largely because of the crackdown on human rights offenders and journalists. International community could not remain sil silent, and international community could not just swallow that award-winning investigative journalist is thrown to jail. Human rights defenders are charged with bogus crime and languishing behind bars. So that's why for Aliyev regime, I would say, this uh, Euro Games was a failure, big image failure, because when we look at the coverage in international media, we would only find about human rights violations and how situation is bad in Azerbaijan. Something that the Azerbaijani regime doesn't seem to have realized is that you can't buy the sort of PR coverage that they're after. The best PR would really be generated by actually implementing some positive reforms. What I would ask the representatives here from the government to take back um, to their minister, to the president, is if you want better coverage of these events, if you want better coverage of Formula One, for example, release the political prisoners. Um, these are people who love their country, who, who want to hold their government accountable for, for you know, implementing not only their international commitments, but their own law. Release them. Um, stop interfering with their ability to take out, you know, to, to do their work as human rights defenders, as journalists. Allow the international community to come in um, unfettered. Allow all journalists, allow all human rights organizations, anyone else, if you want to host these events, um, and actually truly invite the world in. Take some real positive steps towards reform. That will generate the good PR coverage. You know, the, these events aren't, aren't new, really. Um, since about 2012, um, the Azerbaijani government has been actively seeking to host all sorts of international events. Um, some of you might remember Eurovision, which took place in Baku in May that year. 
um, several, you know, lots of events since then, the Internet Governance Forum, and lots of sporting things. That year there was uh, the FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup. Um, big and small, there's been uh, rhythmic gymnastics, there's been chess, uh, there's been an international forum of poetesses, you name it, Azerbaijan is hosting it. They've, they've proven that they can host these events, and in many ways, um, logistically, they can, they can host them well. They have the potential to do some good. Um, they create jobs, um, they generate you know, infrastructure, but unfortunately, the way that they're being um, carried out ha has been damaging to the country, I'd say. Um, not just in terms of, of these prisoners of the games that we've referred to, but um, you know the way that these beautification projects are being carried out have generated massive um, property rights violations as people are forcibly evicted with no real legal recourse. Um, you know, lots and lots of money has been spent. Nassim has mentioned some of the money, um, but actually um, I've seen figures even you know, more outrageous. It seems that much more is being spent than is ever really coming back and, and benefiting the people. Um, it could be done better, but really I'd say it seems to be mostly an attempt at a PR exercise that's maybe misunderstood. Again, implement some real positive reforms, release our colleagues. Um, you know, Rasul Jafarov has never been a person to call for a boycott of anything. This is why I sort of always question why, why the government comes to these things and always says, oh, you call for a boycott of the games. We didn't. Um, I've worked with Rasul on several other campaigns, Sing for Democracy, around um, the Eurovision contest in 2012, Art for Democracy, which got me kicked out of the country. Um, all these things. Rasul is one of the most positive, optimistic people I've ever met. He always calls for further engagement of with Azerbaijan, not isolation. I echo his call. He wouldn't have wanted a boycott of this game. Even, even now, I don't believe he would want that. He would want more attention to the country and people really to come in and understand. Release Rasul. Release Khadija. Release the, the total, it's, there's eight jailed journalists, there's five jailed bloggers in the country, six jailed human rights defenders, uh, three activists of the NIDA civic movement who have been in jail since um, 2013 in connection with the last sort of attempt of society at pro-democratic protests. Release Ilgar Mamadov, he's the chairman of a major opposition party um, who the European court has, has ruled should be released immediately. Um, something that hasn't been mentioned incredibly is we're on the eve of another election here. On the first, this coming Sunday, Azerbaijan will hold parliamentary elections. Um, in recent months, um, really in connection with criticism of these things that we've mentioned, um, Azerbaijan has damaged its relations with several international bodies. Um, for the first time, the OSCE ODIR will not observe these elections, neither will the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, neither will the European Parliament. Um, local election wa watchdog um, Anar Mamadli, who's the chair of the Election Monitoring and Democracy Studies Center, remains in jail still for telling the truth about the last election in 2013. The opposition is broken and fractured and not permitted to, to function normally. And as I mentioned, one of the, one of the opposition leaders, Ilgar Mamadov, sits in jail. These elections, um, long before election day, the, the chance has been eliminated of them being fair and free. Um, so, uh, to the journalists in the room, we would, we would urge you, when, when you report on Azerbaijan, I mean, do pay attention, do try to come to the country. If you get a visa, good for you, but please, when you're there, look around, see what else is really going on. There's not many people left for you to talk to there, um, unless you can get access to Kurt Okana, the de um, investigative detention facility in Baku, or some of the prisons. Um, there's a few of us abroad who can point you in the right direction, but please, um, don't, don't allow yourselves to be part of this attempt at what we call sports washing. If I could deal with the question in the back, um, <coughs> just to give a little timeline. When I first came to Azerbaijan the first time, and James will remember this, 2003, there were already um, billboards with um, late Haider Aliyev and Olympic uh, rings. It's, it's been an, ambi an ambition of the country for a long time. Um, 2015 games, and I assume, anybody here from the EOC in the room by any chance? Um, does an, an you know, you guys may know, I don't know how much people paid attention. And again, this is a decision the government makes, a decision that society makes. It was in his uh, um, presentation. There will never be another sporting event of this size where the host government pays for everything. You know, all athletes' expenses, all travel, all coaches' expenses, all media expenses. If you, to get to the core of your question, how much does it mean to them? That, that's the clearest answer you could ever get. That was an investment they were willing to make to do this. The Islamic games are coming up in a couple of years. This is very important to the country. A couple of soccer games are coming up. The sort of uncovered thing, and again, it gets to the news vacuum in our part of the world, part of which is our fault, 
is when the 2024 uh, list for the Olympics was lowered to five, for want of a better word. Um, Baku was not eliminated, but if you go back and look at it, there was reference to a conversation between Mr. Bach and people in Baku, and they said, well, maybe we, look, maybe we push it back for four years. And it, was, it, wasn't in, it wasn't a formal no, it wasn't an informal no, it was called a bad English gentleman's agreement, so um, that we'll just push it back a ways. Uh, there's other presentations here. If, if the IOC is serious about the human rights stuff, if they're serious about the free media stuff, um, Baku probably doesn't qualify. I mean, to, to me, there's two, there's two kinds of sporting events of these international types. I'm old enough. I, I went to the uh, Pan American Games in 1991 in Cuba, and it was a very similar situation. Every time we tried to drive more than five miles from the baseball stadium, there was somebody there you know, turning us around saying, no, you don't need to see the rest of the company. Go see boxing. Country, I'm sorry. Same, you know, same thing at this point in Azerbaijan. It would be very unlikely, quite frankly, that you'd be able to drive around the country and write about the positive stuff, too. You, you would not have the opportunity to report about the country. You would not have a lot of freedom to do much and see the games. There's a certain irony in this because they have a very sophisticated and on TV at least a very effective tourist campaign, um, which sort of you know, flies in the face of not letting journalists go there and see the country and report about it. Um, so that, that's more like a long timeline, but yep, please. I assume that I don't have the um, information about family ambition for actually Grand Prix and Islamic Games actually. I, I don't imagine how it will be because I am not in this project. I think that uh, it will be a good question for uh, presidents from the government. I think that. Thank you. I uh, had Henrik and then I have you. Um, yeah, Henrik first. <laughs> Yeah, Henrik from the Danish Institute for Sports Studies. Uh, we, we know that, uh, also from your presentation, that it, there was a lot of political purposes. And we also know that if we asked uh, the IOC or the EOC about these issues, they would say that they cannot interfere in that and they are not ruling Azerbaijan. But they are in charge of sporting legacy. And uh, I know that more events are coming, probably also paid by the state. Uh, but has this event I know a lot of state-of-the-art uh, facilities were built in Baku. Has it left any legacy in terms of more sports participation or a better sports movement or better use of these stadiums? Is there any sustainable uh, event, uh, a legacy on, on, on this? No, I, I have a comment, just I have no question. My name is Elchin Safarov. I'm uh, from uh, Baku European uh, Games uh, Operation Committee and Corporate Director of uh, that committee. Yeah, about the legacy, I have a presentation for tomorrow. And uh, I, I would like to invite all of you for that uh, presentation. And I would like to thank for today's presentation. But um, I didn't know that uh, today's discussion will be just political issue because I'm not governmental representative. I'm the sport guy and uh, I, I, I know everything about the European Games and I, I, I was the first employee and the last employee of the Baku European uh, Operation Committee and that's why uh, if that answer a question for ambitions, I will add that ambitions of the people of Azerbaijan is to change uh, oil industry to the sport industry as well in, in future years and we we are straightly going on that. If if we will talk about the list of the people who was arrested or died, unfortunately I don't know them, except Rasim Aliyev, I think he's a sport journalist, but nothing to do with the, gar uh, the government because as I know from the media, he was died on the, on the, the personal, I mean the one of the 
extent. I mean, I don't know even who is that next side, but he was the relatives of the footballist who was, he wasn't agree on the publication. And this is what I know about them. But unfortunately, I didn't see in that uh, list the most of uh, uh, refugees of, uh, from Armenia, which is around one million refugees. This is also the question to human rights. Again, I think that the sports and the politics is a two different uh, floors. And um, unfortunately, if, if someone needs very clear answer on the clear questions, we have to invite here lawyers, politics, and maybe probably um, right persons. But about the European Games, tomorrow I will, uh, I will answer to all questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question over there. Uh, oh, sorry, Chris first, yeah. You mind if I take you in the next round? Uh, Christopher Gaffney, University of Zurich. Uh, thanks to Gulenara, Rebecca, Mason, and David, and especially for your courage in exposing these human rights violations that seem to accompany every major sporting event, no matter where it's held, including London, including Vancouver, uh, including the West, as it were. And so let's not forget that these things happen as a systematic realization of these events and that regimes, whether they be individuals and families or coalitions of politicians and economic elites, seem to employ the games for their own personal benefit. And given this, and that there is no separation between political ambition and sporting ambition, as our colleague here has suggested, to what degree do you think that the IOC, the EOC, should be held responsible for the actions undertaken under the banner of the Olympics? And to what degree should uh, the national federations or the organizing committees themselves be held responsible, perhaps in international courts of laws, uh, of law for the gross human, vi human rights violations that we hear about time and time and time again with the realization of these events? Thank you. My question actually builds a little bit on, on that. My name is Yiji Alford, and I work at the U.S. Department of State in the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And I thank all the panelists for their presentation uh, on this issue of the kind of widespread human rights abuses that have been linked to mega sporting events and now the movement to introduce a human rights criteria to the bidding contracts. I wonder if there's been any effort uh, from the kind of learning on the ground that's happened in Azerbaijan to inform this process and create, um, you know, kind of lessons learned that can feed into uh, this movement. Beware of a journalist, you know, having an opinion and expressing it. I don't like doing it very often. But how, how realistic it is, is it with these mega events you know, we, we started treating them about 20 years ago like behavior modification. Like we'll award it here and an entire society is going to change immediately. But th this, is, this is balderdash. You know, there's a small argument, you know, is it going to help a region economically? Seriously help it in legacy, which you talk about. I'm talking about serious legacy, which is a lot further than stadiums, which are important. New train stations, I'm glad it is important. That's not a lot for $8 billion, and I'm not picking on Azerbaijan. You can go you know, 10 Olympics back. I, I think this whole idea, and it, it gets to your point, I, I don't think there'll be much discussion about it. You know, we've, we've gone through the World Cup thing, you know, a couple places. We'll see how it plays out between now and 2022. We sort of got into this cycle that we're going to fix the world by putting games someplace. And games are very important. That's why we're all here, and I believe in it very seriously. I was a sports editor for a long time before I started doing this work. I think the very concept that you choose a place and say, it, by automatically putting it there, and by having them sign a piece of paper, that an economy, a society is automatically going to change. That, to me, that's foolishness. Somebody asking about sustainable, sustainability in Azerbaijan. Uh, as I checking uh, for August, September, October, and November, uh, sustainability in Azerbaijan is uh, normal, but it is going down. Uh, 
calls, uh, devaluated uh, and inflation of the actually uh, dollar, euro, and uh, Azerbaijani uh, currency. Uh, it is very influence to our actually community for our businesses for our entrepreneurs in Azerbaijan and uh, it will be break down I think that uh, for December and uh, for next year uh, I think that if we will uh, don't make any decision uh, I mean strict decision it will be very created big problems for uh, Azerbaijani community because we will lose our budget actually we spent uh, more money from our uh, government budget and uh, I think that uh, we must uh, decrease actually some of prices and uh, we must in improve develop uh, import and export regulations in Azerbaijan I think that sustainability uh, passes by months uh, it will be decreased Um, in terms of, you know, human rights criteria, um, I'm perhaps somewhat cynical. It's impossible not to be after um, nearly a decade working on Azerbaijan, but I'm, I'm with Dave here. It's countries like Azerbaijan already have extensive international commitments um, to uphold these rights. Um, I, I don't believe that another piece of paper um, would change anything. They've got obligations with bodies that have a hook um, to ensure implementation of this, like the European Court of Human Rights, um, and yet these rights are still not respected. Um, so while it is nice to see sort of more talk about these sorts of issues, um, I, I don't believe that that will really change anything in, in, in authoritarian countries, which, let's face it, are the ones increasingly more willing to, to host these sorts of events. Um, in terms of liability, um, in, in courts of law, this is sort of getting into the more academic um, question of really um, human rights um, responsibilities of non-state actors. I don't, it, that's not something that we've pursued is whether bodies like the IOC, the EOC, these sports, um, the, these national Olympics committees should be held legally liable, but I would, I would say they definitely, definitely do have a moral obligation um, and an obligation in accordance with the Olympic Charter, which as I mentioned does provide for human dignity and press freedom and these sorts of things, um, to not allow themselves to, to, to be used in this way to help um, you know, improve a country's image. Um, in the case of the European Games, I mean, who, we all know who was paying the bills, the paychecks of the, the EOC officials who refused to comment on this. I think it's very clear um, why they, they wouldn't push the line further than they did. Um, National Olympic Committees, as I mentioned, had mixed responses. Um, a lot of the private responses we got were encouraging in that although they, couldn't, they felt that they couldn't speak out publicly, which is what we asked, they were aware of the situation, acknowledged our concerns, and said they had provided information to their delegates. That acceptable, I think, from, from our perspective. Um, oh, and just, I, I wanted to, to thank Mr. Safarov for coming um, very much, and I'm interested in, in your presentation tomorrow as well. Um, and I believe there will also be one tomorrow evening um, on uh, broader issues, but the representative of Amnes Amnesty International will be speaking in part on their experience with Baku 2015 as well. Um, yeah, I'll leave it with Gulia, I believe. <laughs> I think my colleagues have uh, covered pretty much everything. I just want to stress and highlight again that I think that uh, EOC and IOC, they have responsibility uh, before populations for the image of Olympic movement. And Olympic Charter envisages for freedom of expression in Azerbaijan, there is no free expression at all. And I think that uh, that was a responsibility, huge responsibility of IOC to do at least something to ensure that foreign journalists are not banned from coming and covering the event. Uh, Azerbaijani journalists are not in prison while this Euro game is taking place, but they fail to do so. And I personally think that yes, we are, they are responsible because that's a violation of Olymp uh, Euro, um, Olympic Charter, very violation of Olympic Charter, which envisages for free expression and press freedom. I'm afraid we've come to the end of this uh, session, but I'd like to give a round of applause to our speakers and thank you very much. And thank you for coming.